Welcome to our eighth and final Coil Fisher Talk for uh, 2013. We're, uh, Coil is a center for online innovation and learning. We're one year and two months old, and this has been our, our eighth uh, Fisher Talk, so we're uh, pleased to have you here. We do recognize this time of year is a little difficult for faculty and uh, some folks to uh, separate from the activities of end of semester, so we apologize for that. But the event will be recorded and uh, we'll have that made available on our COIL website. So um, we appreciate you being here. We know that there are some of you virtually joining us. Hello. And, um, and we'll, I, t I said to our presenters, we have the best brain trust of Penn State here. It's not in volume, but it's in the, we got the very best. So. Um, so my name's Larry Reagan. I am one of the directors of the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our eighth COIL Fisher Talk. Uh, this afternoon's talk, I was thinking on this uh, title a little bit. I was thinking, geez, uh, are MOOCs old enough to have a legacy? And maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, our, our guests today are um, Haven Ladd and uh, Liz Daber. I got it right, Liz. And uh, they are from a, a research study group called Parthenon. They're uh, primarily based in Boston, but they have offices actually globally. And they're a, um, a think tank that does evaluation and research in the field of higher education from a broad spectrum of issues and topics. So they sort of have the luxury of looking down over the rest of higher education um, and asking questions where they can begin to draw up and look for common themes, commonalities, what we can be learning from that. And they've agreed to come and share a project around MOOCs uh, that they've been involved in for the last year. I think you'll find the findings uh, very interesting and, and provocative. And it begs the question for us at Penn State, uh, where do we go with next phases of MOOCs in our system as well? So with that, let me introduce Haven. And uh, Liz is with us. And Liz, if you'll just face the camera so that they know you're there. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Larry, and thanks to the Center for uh, inviting us down on this sort of cold uh, December day. This does feel like uh, the forum's about right, because we assume there's thousands and thousands of people watching this <laughs> online. Um, so there's a massive experience going on that we actually just can't see in person here, which is quite exciting. So uh, we do want to spend a little bit of time you know, uh, talking about the legacy of MOOCs. And from our perspective as observers, I do think it's right. We do think it's right to begin talking about the legacy. The quick spoiler alert is the future of, of higher education is not all about MOOCs. We view MOOCs as a very disruptive force that has catalyzed a tremendous amount of change in higher education, and increasingly, that change is migrating to the center of the academic core. That's what we're going to talk about. That legacy, that change we're going to talk about today. I will go through, because we are consultants, I'll give a quick background on kind of who Parthenon is in a second. I will go through some data slides, try not to bore everyone, but try and get some of the facts on the table as then we, we then get into some of the perspective that comes out of that. So very quickly, it is probably important to kind of point out sort of our background and where we come from. Parthenon Group, and I'm one of the partners there in our education practice, are not practitioners in higher education. We are strategy consultants. We're business people. Um, we're a very global firm. We've been around about 23 years. Uh, as strategy consultants, what makes us different from most strategy firms that are out there, you know, the big names are McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, Bain, et cetera, is that 30 to 40 percent of what we have done for essentially the lifetime of Parthenon has been in the field of education. And this is a field broadly defined without a lot of outside strategy. And one might ask the question, why does education need outsiders thinking about strategy? Because it's full of incredibly smart people. And we scratch our heads with that one all the time, too. Uh, and, and part of the reason is that in industries that are going through fundamental transformation, the more outside data and analysis that can be brought together with the practical experience and wisdom that the practitioners have, the better the chances there are for innovation and change. And if there's ever an opportunity and a need for innovation and change in higher education, it's just about now. And we'll talk about that going forward. Uh, the perspective that we have in general is a very global one. 
Over the last few years, we've done over 900 individual education projects across 60 countries. I can't rattle off all of those and all the experiences from all of those. I'm a partner in our Boston office. Um, but our, when we work on clients, we work on projects, we bring together all of these experiences, not only globally, but across a wide spectrum of education. And increasingly, we're finding that it's no longer higher education on its own, in its bubble, in its tower, but rather folks are asking the question, how does higher education integrate fundamentally with the issues that K-12 is facing and early childhood and all the issues that you're facing at World Campus, which is how does the traditional higher education model interface with working adults and the needs of the corporate world overall? So we'll talk about some of that as we get into some of our experiences. And the last slide, just to kind of put away as background, is just some perspective on where our biases will come from. This is a list of logos of folks we've worked with recently. So you can take everything that we've said and will say with a grain of salt, uh, and, and that's very appropriately for, so, for doing so. I want to transition now a little bit to the type of work we do and then lead into this discussion around MOOCs. And this slide uh, is an interesting one because we, in our education practice, don't have products. We don't say, here's the work we plan to do overall. We work very differently, which is institutions come to us and say, here are our challenges. Can you help? And what's been fascinating is over the last few years, four big challenges, excuse me, six big challenges have bubbled to the forefront of higher education. And different institutions are grappling with them in different ways, but they all feel incredibly important. First one is on segmentation, branding, and differentiation. How in this flat market do you differentiate yourself? And a lot of that is pulling in learnings from the corporate marketers and the consumer uh, branded companies, consumer products companies, to think about how higher education institutions or programs or offerings can differentiate themselves. The second one is one we were talking about before, which is that over the last decade or so, there's been this bubbling of, of a recognition that the outcomes in higher education are just not very good. Only 50% of the kids that start a four-year degree graduate in six years. It's a flip of the coin whether you're going to make it through or not. For our country's best asset and the world's greatest higher education system, that doesn't sound so good to us. And a lot of institutions are beginning to grapple with that and, and look for outside of, of higher education ways to think about improving student outcomes. A third is tighter linkages to labor markets. I'll come back to that uh, more later. A fourth is transnational education, a big topic about how do we as an institution either take our education abroad or bring students from abroad here or some combination of that. These are huge issues facing all institutions. A fifth that I think everyone's been through, whether they like it or not, and Penn State has been um, very either lucky or fortunate or well managed to be above the fray, many institutions are in a very real way looking at reducing costs. And finally, this whole idea of online learning, online modalities, is just an enormous one. You, as Penn State, are leaders in that field, among the traditional institutions of higher education. But your leadership position is eroding, because everyone else is getting there, too. Everyone who we work with is developing very robust, high-growth online uh, learning modules. So th these are the, the types of things that we work in. Happy to talk more about these later. Today we want to focus on the last one, on online, and specifically what we've learned over the last six to nine months, really, in a, in a relatively large kind of market study we've been doing with traditional universities around MOOCs that has evolved into online. So our perspectives I shared at the beginning is that it is right, in fact, to look at the past the present and the future of MOOCs, or the legacy of MOOCs, as we titled this. We see three evolving periods of online learning. One is what we're describing emerging online. Everything that happened before 2011. You were market leaders in that, as were a number of other institutions we'll talk about. There's been lots of online learning going on for a long, long time. And if you actually go way back and include correspondence courses or distance learning, goes way back to 1892 and other things. 
It's been around for a long time, but why all the fuss right now? And part of the fuss right now comes from what we're calling the MOOC disruption. In many ways, MOOCs evolve as a major disruptive force at exactly the time this industry needed disruption or was ripe for disruption. And it has created a massive amount of head scratching and change that leads into the final phase, which we're calling the future of online. We won't begin to predict the future at all, but more to set the stage that the disruption that's happened from MOOCs, MOOCs are creating something that is going to look and feel materially different going forward, and that there are going to be organizations, hopefully Penn State, that take a, a very much leadership position in, evolve, in, in pushing that strategy and that evolution going forward. So starting with the emergence of, of online overall, if I were to roughly describe the landscape before 2011, the general press would have said the private sector or for-profit, I use those words synonymously in here, private sector institutions dominated the online space. There were, of course, a few innovative not-for-profits that are out there. Um, Penn State has obviously been one that's around for a long time, Drexel and many others. But Although online offerings existed at a majority of schools, and we'll show some slides on this, over 75% of, of institutions, even before 2011, had some sort of online offering, it was not fundamentally part of the academic core. It was separate or, dis, or different or removed. And we'll talk about this MOOC disruption, but that has fundamentally brought online into the academic core, closer to the provost's office, closer to the mission and vision of the university overall. So starting with a historic perspective, this is the, the general data that people thought about when they think about online learning. Edge Ventures tracks this and, and, and always has for a long time. And we took a snapshot in 2011 about the state of the landscape of online-only enrollments. And on the left of this slide are those that are in the private sector, the for-profit schools. Many of these are publicly traded, which is why we have their sticker, the uh, ticker symbols on there. And it's a big number, over 800,000. On the right of those are the traditional schools, which were at the time what we would call the innovators, the early adopters, the progressive ones around online learning. And you see very slightly, you can almost see, Penn State highlighted there in green, uh, Penn State World Campus. But there are other ones, Rio Salado Community College, very low-cost online community college, Excelsior Western Governors University, Liberty, Jerry Falwell's thing, which has grown tremendously even since this slide. That was sort of the beginning. But I think this perspective that was, just in my experience, absolutely dominant in 2010, 2011, missed a lot of what was actually going on in online learning. And it missed it because it was focused on the few institutions with relatively large numbers and was missing a lot of the groundswell of online learning that was happening. So one way to describe that is to look very simply at the overall growth in full-time equivalent uh, post-secondary enrollment, 2002 to 2012. It was about 3% during that period. And you'd say, well, that's unremarkable. That's relatively boring kind of GDP and population growth overall. All this talk about the for-profit sector was, from our point of view, a little bit overinflated because that's the for-profit at the bottom of this. Yes, the growth rates were high, but it's not fundamentally that big a percentage of the overall population. And the two breakouts I've done here on the, on the very, well, so the dark red one is the private sector or for-profit online growth. The lighter one is private sector on-ground growth. So you already begin to see a story that, gee, as the for-profits were growing, the vast majority of their growth happened online, entirely online. Students were not filling lecture halls that looked like this. This is more common. But the piece that people weren't seeing was the following. When you break down that light blue bar I showed before, that in total was about 3% overall, the, the, bright, the light blue bar breaks down into two really interesting segments. Traditional schools offering online enrollments has, over this time period, been growing at a compound annual growth rate of close to 30%. And that chunk is enormous now. That dark blue sector that I'm highlighting is a big sector. The traditional schools offering residential experiences or on-ground or non-residential on-ground has been 
In this case, it looks like growing at 1%. That's rounding up a little bit. That's generous. If you look at the growth over this period, effectively 100% of the growth, both for-profits and not-for-profit schools, has come from online learning. This is all before MOOCs. This is going way back. This is the story that people were missing and has created the seeds of this online transformation that we're in the midst of, of now. Just to highlight that. So another way to look at, at the seeds of online learning before 2011 would again be to look at all the traditional schools that are out there. And this is not-for-profit, this is a map of not-for-profit institutions segmented by their online offering and it happens to be their size. There's about 2,300 of these not-for-profits, so non-for-profit degree-granting institutions tracked by iPads in the U.S. I want to call your attention to the red bars at the bottom, which are the number of schools, and they're segmented by the size of the school, that are not online at all. In total, only about 25% of this map was not online in 2011, and the vast majority of those who were not online are in that very small category, the less than 2,000 students. Those are the schools that don't get articles written about them every day in the Chronicle and elsewhere. And sure, many of them were not online, but still, 65% even of those small schools were online in some way, shape, and form. The, the darker green is online by using uh, or by going it on their own, developing the courses on your own, offering them marketing. The, uh, excuse me, online courses. The, the lighter green, it's hard to, different color on this than it is the screen, but I'll go the lighter green color is online degrees, so full degrees offered by these schools. And it may only be one degree, but the school offers an online only degree that they've done on their own. And then at the very top in the lightish green, lightish blue color, are those schools that partnered with online enablers. It's an interesting slide from our perspective as sort of business consultants, et cetera, because all of the talk that we get from universities is, should I partner with one of these guys, Pearson, Tudor, Everspring, Embanet, BISC, et cetera, should I partner with them? It's like, well, you don't have to. Lots of people have, and I'll talk later about the choices that some of those have to do it, but you certainly don't have to to go online. So everyone was going online, even in this pre-MOOC period. As we look at this, and, and we could debate where we put some of the institutions on this slide, most of that uh, evolution online pre-2011 is what we would call transitional online, or the transitional model. These are institutions who are going online, but the online offerings exist somewhere in that institution outside of the academic core. And ones that are easy to talk to about that are Drexel eLearning or CSU Global Campus, which, which was created as a whole separate institution in the Colorado system. Northeastern, most of the, the online growth is in their college professional studies. We put Penn State World Campus on here because certainly your legacy, going back to 1892, was very different outside as a correspondence course. Maybe you're a little bit more hybrid now because of the relationship of being overseen by a vice provost, the core legacy that all of your offerings are still taught by the academic core. But you know what? To an outsider, it still looks and feels very much like Penn State World Campus is a separate entity from Penn State as an outsider. There are a few universities, for different reasons, who we would argue even before 2011 have fundamentally embraced online learning as core to their academic and their institutional mission. One is Southern New Hampshire University, SNHU, small school in New Hampshire that has grown very big. You've probably all seen their advertisements. I would argue they embraced online learning out of desperation. The business model they had as a small standalone uh, sub-regional school in New Hampshire, vocationally focused, was challenged, and they needed a way to break out. Arizona State University has fundamentally embraced online as different reasons. They've embraced it for growth and economic reasons. They believe that they can be a generator of massive uh, economic growth in Arizona through online learning. But the, those two uh, institutions, there's many others, I want to highlight those two, have had brought, even before MOOCs, online into the center of all of their administrative and management conversations about the future of the school. That was rare. It is no longer rare. So we want to sort of ask what happened. So in 2011, something fundamentally different happened. 
the first MOOC was started. Sebastian Thun started this, and sort of out of thin air, we all started reading about MOOCs, this crazy Californian thing where lots of students are going to massive, you know, open online courses. And over the period of the last two years, and it's, it's actually even, or three years, it sort of um, rounds up to three years if we're really liberal about it. But it's been two and a half years. There's been vast experimentation by a wide range of institutions with this whole concept around MOOCs. There's been a huge amount of money invested, over $200 million as of six months ago, our last count. Uh, and yet, there's been limited, again, aggressive or liberal, there's been no financial success uh, effectively from MOOCs directly. And what the result of all of that has been a widespread discussion of how to use online learning and new models to change the offerings in our institution. That is the exciting disruption that I'll spend most of our time talking about. So let me give a little perspective on why this disruption was happening at the time. Why, when I said at the beginning, MOOCs emerged at a time when this industry was, at, was absolutely ready for disruption. In 2011, there were five big forces that were coming together to dramatically change higher education. The first one is the one that has been written about a lot, but everyone talks about it. The traditional higher education business model was fundamentally challenged. Gone were the days when you could expect 6 to 8% enrollment growth every year and 6 to 8% pricing growth every year, leading to 12 to 16% revenue growth without even really thinking about it. That is no longer true. Endowments, of course, are down. State grants are down. All of the things have gotten worse. The second one is, as I talked about pricing, we've gone uh, in, in a, this MOOC survey as well as other work we've done and talked to over 100 institutions in the last probably 14 or 15 months. Every single one of them has said they believe they are at or near the top of their ability to, to increase prices. Tuition is just simply too high, at least in the, public, in, in the perception of the marketplace overall. You see all the, the, the news articles about the unsustainable levels of debts that students have. It's just too high. So therefore, that's no longer a, lev a lever to paper over cost increases. Competition's fundamentally increasing. And this is competition that now has become national. It's come from non-traditional sources. The Clayton Christensen disruption, disruptive innovation stuff is all out there. And non-traditional um, universities, those outside of the core that we think about all the time, are in fact rising up and gaining market share, whether they are the private sector, whether Southern New Hampshire University or Liberty University or others, that puts some challenge to the ability for traditional universities to gain enrollment growth and market share. Uh, the fourth point I talked about earlier, uh, out, this is again a, a nice way of saying it, but outcomes very widely, I would in fact say more bluntly the outcomes are not very good, and people know that now. And finally, and this is the one that is more emerging, and only a few universities are beginning to grapple with it holistically, that we're, we were at a time and are, are at a time today where universities are thinking about the fact that there may be different students, different segments of the student population who need to be served fundamentally differently. It is very hard now to talk to, a, to ask a big university who your target student is and get an answer that is, in fact, factually correct. Typically, they'll give an answer that reflects historic norms. Our student is a coming-of-age student who wants a college experience, and they want to eventually become a researcher, et cetera. In most uh, diverse universities, those students are a minority of the students that are actually on campus. But yet, they still inform the legacy and the reputation of that campus. So in this environment, universities begin to look for new ideas. And this was the environment in which the first MOOCs were launched. It was an industry ripe for disruption that needed disruption, and MOOCs were it. And all of the news pundits picked up on that all at the same time. It was just amazing to read. Um, I want to show one picture to, to highlight sort of the data that I just showed you. It's a pretty compelling picture overall. It shows two very simple lines. Tuition growth in public four-year institutions compared to mean household income. These are both indexed in real dollars, so inflation-adjusted real dollars, back to 1987. 
and we look at the growth over roughly the last generation in these. And what you see is that household wages have been growing in real terms, inflation-adjusted real terms, about 1% a year. It's been a little bit slower, obviously, during the protracted Great Recession, but fundamentally we bank on about 1% increased ability to pay. Tuition and fees have grown 4% per year over that time in real dollars. That gap of now two and a half times is what leads many universities to say, well, we can't necessarily sustain this. Now, I don't want to oversimplify this because a lot of other things have happened as well. For example, increase in federal financial aid, uh, different abilities to get debt, lots of uh, international students have come in, all sorts of things have changed. But this is the sheer reality around the, the, the widening chasm between price and affordability in higher education in the U.S. today. That's a problem. The second um, slide I want to point to is around, uh, in that environment, the flood of money into the MOOCs. So because of the disruptive environment, because of this breaking of the price-value relationship, lots of folks, foundations, investors, philanthropists, and others, all have come together, or universities have, and said, MOOCs are somehow going to be the answer. We don't know how, but they're somehow going to be the answer. So when we put the slide together a few months ago, there's about $200 million of investment that we could count into the properly defined MOOC space, Coursera, edX, Udacity, we've Khan in there, Udemy and others. And this misses a, a, an investment that is probably an order of magnitude larger than this of all the human capital that's been invested in it across all of the institutions that have been focused on MOOCs. This has created a frothy environment, to say the least, an environment where lots of experimentation can happen, and lots of experimentation could happen with little economic consequences. We didn't have to worry about whether we were making money or not. That environment, we now generally believe as outside observers, is past. We now need to think differently about growing into online than we did in 2011. In that world, we've seen some amazing growth rates of, enrolled, of, of individuals enrolled in MOOCs. This is a slide that tracks as far back as we possibly can to 2010, when Udemy was really the only MOOC that was out there, almost no enrollments. 2011, first you know, official MOOCs that were out there, to 2013. All we've simply done here is pulled individual registered users from all the different websites in the MOOC offerings and just added them up at year end each year. We're at the point, point. this is not data that is tracked in any cohesive way. The point is, here we are, and we updated this just a month or so ago. At year end 2013, there's close to 10 million registered users in MOOCs. And that's individual people taking individual courses. So one could look at this and say, well, wait a minute, if that growth rate keeps going, it's going to be 100 million in another two years. And it can keep going beyond that. We don't believe that to be true for a variety of reasons which we'll talk about. One which I'll talk about here is this latent demand effect. MOOCs popped onto the scene and enabled a bunch of people who are interested in topics to now study that topic for the first time. I could be very interested in computer science. I'm working full time. Suddenly there's a computer science MOOC, and I can say, ah, I'm going to actually learn a little bit about that. That's fun. But it's not core to the academic mission and vision of the institutions. It was a, an example of products popping up and tapping into a bunch of latent demand, which we believe now is beginning to taper off. Uh, and I'll talk much more about the outcomes of this in a second around this tapering. One example of why we think this is beginning to taper off is that, the, frankly, the growth rate of MOOC offerings is unsustainable. It's too fast. MOOCs, by their very definition, are designed to be massive and open. And therefore, only a few will be able to attract the massive numbers that are out there. As I, we look at one example of this, just the edX platform, in you know, between spring 2012 and fall of this year, four semesters, really, They've offered 79 individual MOOCs that are out there. Everyone else is doing the same thing, which means 
the proliferation of these offerings is going to fundamentally erode the idea of massive. It's going to fundamentally erode the idea that this can tap into a latent market demand and transform education as we know it. Another way to think about this definition of massive is, I remember and we looked back at all the, our Google searches when this really started, the definition of massive was constantly enormous and inflated. Many people actually thought about massive as going up to you know, a million enrollments in an individual MOOC. We'll just be a little conservative here and say massive, according to the news articles, was these courses were going to obviously have more than 100,000 reg registered users. So on this chart, I looked at the range of massive is probably between 100,000 and 200,000 plus registered users in a MOOC. Well, we looked at the Harvard X offerings. Harvard should be pretty good, kind of know what they're doing. All the, ed all the edX investment, they put $30 million of their own money into it. They developed some great MOOCs with certainly some world-class professors. And what you see is, across all of the ones that developed, and there's a whole long tail after this, but we've just highlighted the ones we can actually get numbers for, cumulative enrollments in these MOOCs since inception up through September of this year don't really get you jazzed up about the massive notion anymore. You look at the big ones, Intro to Computer Programming, 160,000 total students have signed up for it. And all these definitions, by the way, are signed up, not complete. Let's be very clear about that. Signed up for it. Maybe that's in the range of massive. But then Justice, uh, Sandel's course, and Science and Cooking sounds great. Letters of the Apostle Paul. There are 6,000 people that are really interested in, in Letters of the Apostle Paul. There probably are still 6,000 people, but maybe not 6,000 every year new students who want to take that course and on from there. So we think that the, the notion of this massive open online course is a little bit inflated overall. One of the reasons it may be inflated, I think you probably all know this collectively, but this is a chart, again, probably hard to read from there, that looks at completion rates across all of the MOOCs that we could get data for. And we've color-coded them by where they're offered, MITx, edX, et cetera, um, Coursera, Udacity. And again, the completion rates, and we all know this from what we read, are uninspiring. The top ones are only 12.5% of the students that sign up for the MOOC actually complete the course. At the bottom end of the range that we can get data for that we can see, which is probably still very, very high, is about 4 to 5%. So a lot of students have a latent demand for the intellectual curiosity and maybe the potential promise of MOOCs, but the reality in terms of transforming education feels a little bit overblown. It is a disruption, but as we think about MOOCs themselves, as an entity, they will not be the disruptive changer in the sense that all of higher education is going to look like MOOCs in the future. It can't really mathematically play out that way. And when we look at sort of Google search trends, just another sort of snapshot, lots of scattered lines, the point of the lots of scattered lines is, these are all different sort of MOOC searches that are out there, is that a lot of the, the observers of the space, and there's some quotes up there, suggest, you know what, this may be sort of a fad. Things are beginning to flatten out from 2012 to 2013. We did at, at Parthenon also an informal literature search of all the news articles we could find. And the amount of articles that have been written about MOOCs in 2013 is down to, on our count, crosses up to about 60% of those that we can find in 2012. So it's not accelerating, it's actually declining in terms of interest overall. What we do see happening coming out of this disruption is something that we believe is fundamentally exciting. And this is where we'll save some time at the end to talk about. What's fundamentally exciting is this emergence of a conversation around how online learning itself can begin to innovate the academic core. Across the, the spectrum of this slide, we've shown sort of five different models of online offerings, online modalities, if you will. And I, I need to be really careful when I define models and stuff because there's not bright lines that differentiate. They're constantly evolving. But on the far left, we have what I think about as online enhancement to on-the-ground traditional learning. So some of your courseware is going to be online. Your syllabus is certainly going to be online, and you're going to have some tutorial access online. 75 plus percent of institutions, and it's probably more than that now, have some of that out there. 
The second one sort of moving to, to the right here is around hybrid online and residency programs. So this is for students who take some of their, their course offerings on site, some of them online. This exists almost everywhere right now because almost all students across all big universities will take at least one or two courses fully online. These are residential students who frankly don't want to go to a course at 8 in the morning or 9 in the morning. They'd rather sit at their dorm in their pajamas and take the course online. Fundamentally, that makes it hybrid. It's out there. We don't find that all that innovative. It just fundamentally exists. And then, of course, there's the world of fully online programs, which are not innovative at Penn State, are more innovative for other institutions which haven't been doing it for a long time. But you've been doing this 100% online offering since, what, 1997-ish? Is that somewhere in 98? So somewhere right in there, a long time. That whole category of online, we sort of define, not pejoratively, um, but sort of optimistically as the new traditional. In order to participate in higher education today, you need to, as an institution, offer some online learning. I think you all at Penn State get that. You've embraced it, of course, and every other institution is embracing it as well. What we find much more exciting is this emergence out to the far right, this category that we label as student-paced models, where we're inverting the original, the historic academic model from someone like me up here lecturing on something to a group of students all at the same time over a course of a semester with assessments at the end and a nice graded exam to something where the student actually dictates the learning. The student can experience the learning at her own pace, his own pace, at her own time. MOOCs were one early example of that. MOOCs were all student-paced by definition um, in some way, shape, or form. The students had to get through the content over time. What is much more exciting, and, and, and this is where we are so optimistic about the innovation that's happening because of MOOCs, is this migration to the right around competency-based learning, around fundamentally figuring out what skills a student needs to learn in order to be successful, developing learning modules so the student can obtain those skills at his or her pace, develop credentials or badging or assessment to assess those skills, and we may get to a world where that could happen completely outside the confines of a traditional university. Could certainly happen outside of the four-year model for BA or the two-year model for associate degrees. Can certainly happen for working adults and may not happen by just one individual institution offering all of the learning for a student. Students may jump around to lots of institutions as they build up credentials over time to fulfill their career. There's some really interesting examples that we show on here overall, and, and we've intentionally sort of made the MOOC kind of column here a little bit small and made this competency-based learning one a little bit bigger. The reason for that is that some of the original MOOC providers, I'll take edX for example, have migrated out to the right and really thought about how do we credential the MOOC in a material way. So edX, for example, working through MIT has created the X series where students can take the seven courses that are required gen eds for the computer science degree through the MOOC, package them together, pay for assessment at the back end for each course, tutored or proctored assessment, cost you 700 bucks, and you come out with the credential that says you've fulfilled the gen ed requirements for a CS degree. That's pretty cool. That fundamentally changes the way learning works. It has all sorts of economic model implications, which we're happy to talk about. You know, another example there of these MOOC providers moving to the right, uh, Udacity was sort of the lead, one of the three leading partners with Georgia Tech College of Computing in developing this new model with AT&T where they are creating the credentials that AT&T's employees need to be successful at AT&T in partnership with Georgia Tech at a low price, with Udacity and with AT&T. That is changing the way we think about the academic offering, the way we offer academic offerings to our students. And that, we feel, is, is driving the big disruption here. Some of the other ones I'll talk about, Southern New Hampshire University you know, has been the first traditional not-for-profit school, an independent not-for-profit school, to get Title IV authority or, uh, or to, to be able to offer um, 
Title IV funding for their associate degree competency-based offering, the College for America offering. They're going for a bachelor's degree next, and that's in process right now. That changes things because the, the fastest students who have gotten through their associate degree offerings have done so in a matter of months, not years. Now, months working almost full time, but months, not years. And that changes the dynamic. Western Governors University has been doing competency-based learning for, quote, a long time. They're sort of the, the, the old, um, now legend of competency-based learning. Their model's a little bit different. They're outside of traditional accreditation processes because of how they're set up. But they're farther along the spectrum of academic innovation. So what we see is this legacy of the MOOC disruption is a whole conversation evolving within institutions about how do we use online learning to innovate the academic offering that we have as an institution. That gets exciting. And that's where we were having conversations earlier today about who's the most innovative, who's leading the innovation out here. This is a world where the traditional universities, like yourselves, can actually lead the innovation in a much faster, more real way than the for-profit institutions can, because you have this academic core from which to draw. It's incredibly exciting from our point of view, incredibly powerful, I think, from your point of view going forward. So I want to show some examples of what success looks like. So, so Western Governors University has been doing competency-based enrollment for, quote, a long time. Um, 5,000 students in 2005, 40,000 students in 2012. That rate of growth maybe isn't necessarily sustainable for them going forward, but they're doing so in a fundamentally innovative way, very low cost, very high student-to-faculty ratios, because they don't really have full-time course instructor faculty. Faculty are fundamentally tutors in that model overall. Um, and offering a number of programs, which we highlight at the bottom. But they are constantly cited as an example of what happens when you innovate a model, work outside the norms of a traditional university, create something from scratch, and see what happens. Well, 40,000 students have said, eh, pretty good. So now I want to talk about the future. As I said at the beginning, we can't pretend, pretend to predict the future. What we can do is talk about what we are seeing across institutions right now that can help enable them to be really successful in this increasingly competitive environment of online learning in the future. And there's you know, four big themes that, that we see as just truisms right now that you're going to be dealing with going forward. The first one is increased competition. Penn State World Campus had a great head start because fundamentally no one else was doing what you're doing. There are a few exceptions, but by and large, in terms of big traditional institutions with a great brand reputation, a long track record, and a good football team, offering online learning was relatively unique. You've been doing that for a long time. That is not the world of the future that you're going to be living in. A hundred percent of your peers in this country and, and increasingly outside this country will be offering online learning. And they all want your students. And you want theirs. In that world, differentiating the offering at an individual program level will become increasingly critical to success. And it's also one that's, in, that's quite challenging for universities. Historically, universities have gone to market with one big offering. We are Penn State. We are Harvard. We are Princeton, et cetera. One of the things that the for-profit uh, market has begun to learn is that students, don't, students outside of the traditional coming-of-age student don't buy that way. They buy by deciding what they want to do with their lives first and then finding an institution that can meet those needs. I've been a nurse for a long time. I want to get my BSN so that I can take a managerial role in the hospital. Okay, I'm working full-time. I want to look for places that offer an RN to BSN at my time schedule, at my price point, that cater to, that they'll take advantage of some of the learning I already have as a nurse already in my prior training. That's the way I think. I don't think I'm going to go to Drexel's nursing program. That's not the first defining characteristic. You've got to start with what these students are looking for. So increasingly, we need to differentiate around our individual programs, and we'll talk more later about both individual programs and individual students. The third one is that online learning, as I talked about at the beginning, 
will have moved, let me use future perfect, will have moved from the periphery to the core of what all institutions are doing. It is a, a fundamental part of the mission and vision of, of, in the future of most institutions. Today, it's getting to that point at Penn State, so you have an advantage there. But you can decide for yourselves how core it is fundamentally when you think across the campus. But that the world of the future is this has got to be a core part of what the university is doing and what it believes it can do really, really well. And that leaves, it leads into the last point. Uh, which is a little bit of a nuanced point and, and, and pretty important to point out. Online learning, unlike many of the other didactic forms of learning in universities, really benefits from scale. If you're servicing students online, you want to scale IT infrastructure, scale marketing infrastructure, scale 24-7, 365 days a week student support on a call center that reaches out to students, you want instructional design capability that is truly world-class, that can produce HBO-level quality videos that everyone in the institution can take advantage of. And universities, by and large, resist scale. Although they can be quite big, they, they become very siloed. And that's just a reality across all universities. So getting the organization and the execution right means breaking down those barriers and creating some sort of offering at scale across your university. Again, I'll say this is one where Penn State has an advantage of world campus. You have some scale there that's been doing this for a long time that is used to working across all of the different schools and departments. Um, but it's hard, very hard for many institutions to do. And we, again, we won't predict the future, but one of the conversations we're hearing constantly across universities is how much centralization do I want and can the university and the shared governance model afford, and how much decentralization do we allow to really spur innovation? Because the idea is that the innovation happens at the faculty or decentralized level, but we need scale to get it right, to execute it right. That's a hard dynamic. The, if we have time, the last few slides I'll show in here show a number of different organizational models that different universities have taken to try and address that. Not one of them is right. They're all just different experiments to figure out how to gain that scale and work within an academic environment. So why is this so important? Why is the future so different than the past? I'll start with a slide that I showed earlier in the day to a smaller group. Um, it's so different in the past because fundamentally the future is so different from the past. The past has been one where enrollment growth in traditional institutions has been upwards, has been steadily upwards for a long time. I showed you that slide before that said 3% overall enrollment growth in traditional not-for-profit schools. Um, here's a slightly different uh, look at it, going slightly farther back. But what we're showing on this slide is in the gray bars, the actual enrollment. So that, uh, what we get from iPads every year, full-time equivalents enrollments. Parthenon, for 15 to 20 years, has been developing and using the exact same forecasting model that forecasts post-secondary enrollments. The results of that forecast model are the blue. It's a multivariate regression model. And we don't always get it right, as you see, but we're pretty darn close. And so we could be wrong this time, but I doubt we're dramatically wrong. And what we see is an inflection point in 2013 where we go from a period of 25 years, a generation of unfettered growth to ones of flatline overall demand for post-secondary growth. In fact, in the four-year market, we see slight declines forecast in our model. I don't want to be that precise, but say roughly flat. Now, why is that? Some people, if you read the popular press, would argue it's because college is not worth it anymore. The price value thing is no longer in students' favor. Factually, that's not true. If you look at the returns from the labor market or the reduced unemployment rate to any college credential, associate degree, bachelor's, master's, and above, relative to high school and no high school diploma, it is very clear that college is economically worth it. In fact, when you look at the return, when we calculate the return on investments of the decision to go to college, you get an ROI, I'll so business speak for a second, an ROI of between 50% and 75%. There are no investments you could ever look at anywhere in your life that have an ROI of greater than 50% other than going to college. So college returns are still there. Um, and I won't describe it in detail, but that is reflected in 
the long-term social trend, which is built into the model as this trend going back to World War II and depicted in the red line. It is true there has been some flattening of demographics that go to college. The echo baby boomers are growing up. And so the green line looks at the tracking population growth. And yes, it was favorable and accelerating for a while. As the echo boomers are out of the system, we see a little bit of flattening, but actually a bit of an uptick starting in 2016 to 17 again. The big issue is that we had a unanticipated growth driven by the poor economy over the last four years. As the unemployment rate skyrocketed, everyone who was making the choice between a job and school chose school, inflated the numbers of people that were going to school well above the sort of long-term trend line, that red line. And what we anticipate happening is a beginning flattening of, as that bubble works its way out through the system. This fall, as you probably all saw, enrollments at most campuses were slightly down over time, which is the first time in uh, roughly 20 years that people had seen that system-wide in the country. So, so the future, as I say, is different from the past. It will be more competitive because there isn't this continued growth of underlying demand for post-secondary. It's also different because when we ask people um, about their plans for online learning overall, uh, and this comes from the survey we did this summer, uh, almost everyone says they'll offer you know, online, or in this case MOOCs, within five years. It's prevalent, and MOOCs is shorthand here for any other online they could possibly be doing. But it's no longer something that just a few people are doing. Everyone is doing across all the big public schools, across private schools, et cetera. So you will have, across your offerings, a tremendous amount of competition in an environment that's not growing. That changes the world a little bit. When we ask people you know, how they're thinking about online and in the future, what are the, what are the key reasons that drive them to think about online learning, there's four key features that come together in everyone's mind. I'll talk more about these in a second. But uh, different institutions prioritize these different pieces of the puzzle in different ways. Some say they're going online five years from now in order to expand access to their institution. Others say, interestingly, to improve the student experience. But very few schools have systematic processes to take learnings from their online learning experience pipe them back into their on-the-ground experience. There's just usually a divide there. So even if you understand, you make these big breakthroughs that say, I know what makes certain students tick online. You don't have any way of telling your faculty who are teaching an on-the-ground course what makes students tick. So there's a lot of work to be done in that upper right one. A third one is to enhance, enhance societal impact. A lot of universities, particularly public universities, have a mission to spread learning overall. Uh, online learning is certainly a way to disseminate uh, the teachings and the experience of their faculty. And a fourth one, which is a very real one for many institutions, is politely labeled drive institutional sustainability, unpolitely labeled to make money. Because if you look at the other sources of revenue that are not growing, you could say this online thing is somehow going to make us money. And thinking about how to make us money is one of the big challenges they're faced. But Different institutions put these puzzle pieces together in different ways, but the fundamental reality of it is that they're all choosing to go online. And that creates a very tough competitive dynamic for everyone in the game. So as we think about sort of what it takes to win in the future, yeah, yeah perfect. When we think about what it takes to win in the future, Parthon's perspective, so this is, not, this is outside the data now, let's move on to Parthon's perspective. Parthon's perspective is that it takes a really intentional strategic process that starts with asking which students we want to target. And that question cannot be asked at the university level. That is the wrong place to ask that question. Because at the university level, for, certainly if you go out to your alumni at Penn State, I have a pretty clear understanding of what they'll say to answer that question but which is very different from asking it for an individual program or a department or a school or part of world campus or whatever. You want to get really specific as what type of students are we trying to target, 
what are their needs and how we're going to meet their needs. You build on that to figure out what is our unique value proposition. What is our value proposition that's different from a for-profit, different from Ohio State, different from Liberty, different from anyone else? And um, then, from our point of view, translate that value proposition into a business model that works. And that business model is fundamentally informed by the right service model for students. The service model elements are ones that, just from hearing you, we spent the day so far with you at World Campus, I feel like you are slightly farther along in than other institutions. But for so many years, there was no real conversation at university administrations about how we service our students. What do you mean how we service them? We have all these great classes and lectures. They come to us, they take them, and then they leave. In the online world, we think about how do we proactively reach out to the students that are beginning to drop behind before they drop behind. How do we figure out how to put together different sets of learning modules to have two students in the same class learning at a different pace, maybe with a different scope? Those kind of questions are fascinating. How do we bundle in career services really early so that students take and develop the right skills to be successful in a career if they're adult learners very, very early in the process? Getting that support model right, that student services model, the delivery model, uh, is, is fundamental to success overall. And the starting point, and given time, the last slide I may leave you on, is this one, which is, from our perspective, as I said, it all starts with student segmentation. As we've looked out and done this over the years and surveyed lots and lots of students, six unique student segments bubble up. They are not unique by institution. So many institutions serve multiple student segments at once. But each student segment is unique in their needs, in their behavior, and their demographics. The first one is, is very easy to describe. describe. A traditional coming-of-age student comes out of high school, wants to spend four years in a residential campus, tailgate, have fun, maybe learn to do other irresponsible things, and they'll eventually get on with their life, but they need that, that um, certificate of attendance that said, I went to Penn State, and I made it through, and I'm going on with my life. They are, in fact, the minority in higher education today by, by large numbers. A second segment, which I'll differentiate from that, are those that are career starters, so also young in age. But they know what they want to do when they get out. They've known since eighth grade they wanted to be a doctor or a nurse. And they need to get through as quickly as possible to the point where they can start their career. They want to be a technician, a computer scientist. We had a lot of people dropping out of school to go program computers during the first wave of dot-coms because they thought school was too slow for them. Those are the ones we need to meet their needs differently to get them on with their career as quickly as possible. Third body that's, that's very big, there are researchers, and there always will be, whether they, they are early or late in their career in academics, but there's a real research component to this that we can never overlook. And lots of times when, when we talk to public sector institutions or third tier or fourth tier institutions, they kind of say, well, research doesn't matter. It does matter. It's core, a core mission of higher education. And recognizing that the needs of our researching students may be different than other students is critical to success. Fourth one is sort of the dabblers. These are the ones who jumped onto the MOOCs when they first came out or might go to their community college to study French. They're academically curious. Sometimes they might be academically curious throughout their life. Sometimes they may go in and out of schools consistently. The bottom two segments are more, um, and I'll use an unpopular term, but it, it conveys what I'm trying to say, it's more vocational in nature. Career accelerators, and I talked about the RN to BSN nurse for a while. You know, these are people who are typically working adults. They need another credential, often a BA, to get on with their career, to go from entry level to management. And they need to do that quickly at their own time. They're all working, and most of them, because of their age, have young children at home or a single parent, you know, single parent families. They have a lot of life outside of school that they have to deal with. And then the final segment, uh, overlapping with career accelerators, are those that we, call, we label job jumpers. We find a lot of people who are dissatisfied in their career of choice and want to, particularly in an economic recession, go into higher education to learn different skills to get into a new career. This is the most economically countercyclical sector, sector of all of these. Um, and so there's a very big, big group uh, in this last 
Great Recession overall. The point of this is that these, the needs are different, and being intentional about how these needs are different is key to getting this right overall. I will posit, I'll throw on a slide that, that posits an overlay that I guarantee is wrong, but it's only to get people thinking overall, which is I had those five br broad segments of online learning modalities or offerings, if you will. I'll just throw it onto that slide for the, the sake of argument to give some thought to where it could be. So, for example, online enhancements to on-ground traditional. These are the, the tutoring stuff. You're going to take one course or not. Clearly, that serves the coming-of-age student who is too lazy to get out of her pajamas to go to, court, to school in the morning or wants to study late. The career starters may also do that because they want to get through very, very quickly. If you can actually take an on-ground and online experience and get through maybe in three years, you've really done something. You've taken one year of opportunity cost out of the equation. I'll jump over to the right, hybrid online residency programs. These are programs that can work very well for folks across their, their sort of academic careers. And you could imagine spending, you know, researchers spending a lot of time in the field continuing to stay involved with the university through an online experience and then coming back to the university for a semester or two weeks for a residency program to keep the connection with the institution, with the academic world going. MOOCs, I'll stay on the top of this, could sort of go any, everywhere, and everyone's trying to figure out where MOOCs are, but I intentionally made them relatively small because we see in the future it's not all about MOOCs, it's about all these other things. But you know, MOOCs are really, when, when we, we read about what's going on, they certainly cater to the academically curious. I talked about that already. Um, in theory, they were meant to cater to some career starters. People said MOOCs are a way to fundamentally break the price value equation and make this much more lower cost as kids want to get a, a degree in order to get a job, MOOCs will be perfect for them. Turns out that's a little bit of a tough uh, fit just because you have to be very, very academically motivated to be successful in a MOOC without support because they're, they're by and large non-supportive models. And that's hard to do at that stage in your life typically. Coming of age student, we debate this all the time about whether these traditional residency, residential students the 18-year-olds, the 19-year-olds are really at all the target market for MOOCs. Well, they may not be, but yet anyone who is applying to a traditional program in a school that offers a MOOC is going to take that MOOC as well, at least try to take it, because how could you not? If you're going to MIT, how could you not take one of their MOOCs before you enroll, just to show that you care? It's sort of out there. So MOOCs are, are interesting, and they're, they're evolving and moving. And then thinking about how to fit the needs of the working adult segment down at the bottom, the career accelerators and the job jumpers. That's where we see, I'll, I'll focus on the right here as the last sort of point, that's where we see the biggest opportunities for this whole world of competency-based learning. I intentionally say the whole world because there's lots in that of badging, of self-paced learning, et cetera. But that's where much of the academic innovation we see is going to emerge and going to rest with that student segment. So the point we have taken away from all of this, and I'm sure this isn't right, by the way. This will constantly evolve. The point is for you as an organization or as leaders of individual departments or as thinkers about the world of online is to be articulate about this, about what student segment you're trying to serve and what is the right product offering for that student segment. That's where the innovation is going to come from, and that's going to lead to, we believe, a dramatic change going forward. So I'll leave it here. As I mentioned before, the last slides after this are around organizational models, which are a little too complex to see on slides. But So uh, I think with that, happy to take any questions. We have 10 minutes or so, I think, is the timing. So um, we, we've probably need to wrap up only because we know that there's another group coming in. But but let's see if we can get one critical question. Anyone out there with a – Jerry? Competency-based learning, and uh, the disadvantage don't come up. Now, in this country, there are 45 million people who are illiterate. We would be perfect audience, I would think, for designing competency learning. But that doesn't come up in the discussion, and I wonder why. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an immense segment of people and who it would help all kinds of ways. 
if you taught basic math and literacy to a whole lot of well, single mothers of children. Let me just give an example. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating um, uh, topic and a huge area where people are thinking a lot about how to take the, some of the skills of learning from a competency-based world. Oh, you need to hear this. Excuse me. And develop uh, courses that are developmental or remedial in, in nature. Interestingly, a lot more of that research right now and, and practice is coming out of the K-12 sector. A lot more of it's in the K-12 sector than the higher ed sector. And the reason is, is that particularly in large urban environments, you have this fundamental mismatch of the education offering, the core education offering, versus where many students are. So for example, in Chicago, where it was recently, we're all trying to align to the common core. So you imagine, OK, teaching sophomores in high school, 10th graders in high school, something that's aligned to the common core. Well, the problem is that many of your 10th graders, not all of them, but 20% of them are reading at a fourth grade reading level or less. In that world, you need to fundamentally differentiate your offerings. And because of that, there's actually been a lot of philanthropic dollars uh, going after developing competency-based learning modules for that uh, Again, kind of the stuff. model is for children, not for 40, 50, 60-year-olds right. uh, who are a large part of this group of people who are illiterate. Why isn't that part of the picture, what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. Why the, the rural poor, this is one large yeah. group of people, who are part of this group, many of whom are part of this group, and that we don't talk about them. Right. My question is why? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think the only thing I would say is I think over time, as the models are developed, it absolutely should get there. It will get there, and money will flow. Um, it's, you know, we can't answer why it hasn't been done yet. More or less making an observation of what's happened and try to map it out. I think this is really an interesting uh, framework and structure. And, and first of all, I want to say thank you to Haven and Liz for coming down and sharing these ideas with us. Um, I think you're right on the framework of this. It's going to change and morph and because and, I wonder if there's another way to arrange this where maybe what we do is look at this as a pie and say for each of these particular segments, which I appreciate the way you've segmented those, are there solutions that fit from every one of these five delivery modalities that might address their needs? Great way of thinking about it. And I think your point about starting with overlaying the, the discipline on top of that. So you have to start at the academic program yeah. level. So maybe the career starters in X are different than career starters in Y, and different combinations make sense. That's right. Exactly. I just like to while I have the mic, thank you. I, I think this was a great, uh, really put a lot of things into perspective really well and, and helped me solidify what I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Deborah? So, how does the, you talked about it one slide that eventually you have to create a business model? So, what's the loss leader in this? And how, I mean, when you talked about a program that's got, you know, costing $700 for students to get three credits or whatever it was your example was. I'm sorry, I mm -hmm. didn't remember it accurately. But education costs a lot of money. One of the things we, the MOOC group here has been talking about is what does it cost to create a MOOC? Yeah. And, and so if you look at business models, what do you have any thoughts yet on what a business model looks like for this? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of emerging business models that are coming out. We're not going to get into the detail now. Um, but one of the things I will say is people are beginning to make money in two different ways around online learning. One is by articulating it as a loss leader or a marketing tool to get people into something else that is, quote, higher economic value. But another way is to change the delivery model so that online learning no longer loses money. And uh, those com being clear to yourself about what you're trying to do and what the economic model is is the only way to, to sort of figure out where on that spectrum you're going to be and how it's going to look. Uh, you ha you, again, at the beginning, you gave those different institutions that have used online education for different reasons, the Connecticut School and mm -hmm. the other one. And, um, and then you said, you know, to make it, you just said so that education, online learning doesn't lose money. Well, online learning, if you're trying to maintain an infrastructure like, let's use Penn State as an example. I mean, we have a huge infrastructure here. And then on top of that, we're trying to add online learning. So what's going to give? What building's going to get 
emptied out and sold to a business. I mean, you know, what I'm saying is why does online learning lose money? Is it because we're trying to maintain our physical facilities or is it the other way around? So, you know where I'm so, Yep, so, so the only I'm thing I'll say to that, yeah, w without answering that question, the only thing I will say to that is there are a huge number of large schools that make a lot of money in online learning. I'll leave it that way. So the, the, the right answer for Penn and how, you know, what gets traded off is an incredibly complex one. And what, is, what we find fascinating about universities is the level of complexity within them also allows a lot of room for experimentation and innovation because, frankly, there are things that can give over time. You know, really simply it doesn't mean, oh, we're going to sell a bunch of buildings, but the university and all these universities are big enough and complex enough that they can make investments from one part of the university to fund others as they're in periods of growth, and then those others may end up contributing lots of dollars back into other parts of the university later. So, it, Right. Yeah. Hey, I, I just, uh, any other questions? I've got one real quick one. As you were going out and doing this scanning, um, and mostly what you presented on today had to do with sort of business organizational models and such, are any of these schools who were involved in MOOC activities talking about the impact pedagogically back on to either their what we'll call traditional online programs or their resident face-to-face -face programs? Did you yeah. see that, hear that? Yeah, we, we heard it a lot as a desire. And, and almost everyone we talked to said, the reason we're getting into MOOCs is because that's the future of learning, 21st century learning, and we're going to use our learning from that to inform the way we educate students in the more, quote, traditional settings. Everyone talked about it, but no one we saw had a good system of how to do that, how to take learnings from the online classroom and bring them into the on-ground classroom, or Take learnings from your, your early adopter professors who love teaching online and figure out how to, to improve the, the teaching of others. Not to say that everyone needs to teach online by any means, um, but no one had a good system for that that we but, saw. Liz? No, but what I might add is that um, what we found is that even though 75% of institutions were online prior to the disruption, most of them did not leverage their existing systems when they entered the MOOC space. And we kind of termed it the UVA effect. And when the president was ousted at UVA because one of the trustees lived in Greenwich, Connecticut and read an article in the New York Times, a, an a opinion piece by Thomas Friedman, you know, the president was sort of called to the carpet about not being innovative. And all of a sudden, all these presidents and administrators wanted to have a sound bite about what they were doing on online. And most of them jumped into the MOOC space, a lot of them with Coursera because the entry fee was so low. And they run their MOOC efforts in a siloed fashion with often having three or four professors, because you have to offer three or four courses, reporting into the provost or a special assistant to the provost. And they weren't really run through their distance education operation. So they wanted to, they, they say they want to take their learnings but they have these two separate operations and no bridge between the two of them is sort of mostly what I found. When I, was, <clears throat> I was just going to add that one of the reasons why we haven't taken a lot back from MOOCs into the traditional classroom yet is because the initial MOOCs really were sort of the traditional classroom taken online. And as we see more with peer uh, support systems and peer, uh, you know, uh, tools that will scaffold peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. interactions and so on, I think we'll, we'll find more the more we innovate in the MOOC space, the more we'll find we have something to bring back rather than just... Yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah. That initially, I think for a lot of institutions, in order to get faculty involved, it was very much just like, you know, please come play. And we saw a lot of MOOCs on weather, and there was one on puppetry, and it was just sort of, you know, whatever you might be interested in. And as the grant money has changed, a lot of the grant money now is about learning outcomes. And so what I've seen a lot more of is that institutions are running MOOCs concurrently with comparable brick-and-mortar offerings. Princeton is doing a ton of this. And what they then are doing is having connectivity points in between their MOOCs and their in-classroom offerings. There was actually a professor there, a world history professor that I met with, and he said he had probably the biggest 
learning point in his career. He had a class on world history, and he had regulated points where everyone would have to be a part of the same teleconference. And he made a, com a comment in the teleconference that women during World War II in Russia had to feed their children, you know, parts of dead bodies because there wasn't any food. And there was this incredible uproar from a number of students in Russia about this is just one more example about you in America always painting us in this bad light. And it, he, he said for the first time then that informed his in-classroom experience and they had a lot of debate. And what he said was it really articulated the point that your perspective on world history depends on where you live. Mm -hmm. And he said, so that that's the beginning. And now, so they have, they are now trying to um, connect their moots, their brick and mortar offerings. The one lesson learned was initially they <laughs> did it as optional and none of the brick and mortar students participated. So that was sort of the next generation was they had to, m m mandate that you had to attend these kind of sessions. But I think that's where, I mean, in the, in the instances that it's occurred, it's been very powerful. And this is one of the reasons that um, we got in, when we got into MOOCs about a year ago, the conversation started in earnest. Uh, we articulated a variety of, of motives for, for why Penn State would enter. And, and this was one of great interest to us, and that is the potential impact of what can we learn about this in order to scale and do online education. So I just wanted to, to see if you were also hearing that. Um, I'm watching our time and know that we've got another group coming in. So uh, again, Haven and Liz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us.